This is Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. We're here to help you keep your finger on the pulse. Welcome back to Audible Bleeding. I'm Adam Johnson here with Dr. Sharif Falozi. Today, we will be discussing the best CLI trial with two of the principal investigators, Dr. Alec Farber and Dr. Matthew Menard. The BEST CLI stands for the best endovascular versus best surgical therapy in patients with critical limb ischemia. BEST CLI is a prospective, multi-center, randomized, multi-specialty, open-label, two-arm comparison to evaluate the effectiveness of BEST surgical to BEST endovascular revascularization in patients with CLI. 2,100 subjects will be recruited from over 130 multidisciplinary vascular centers in the U.S., Canada, Europe, and New Zealand with over 1,700 patients currently enrolled. The trial is a multidisciplinary study, which includes interventional cardiology, interventional radiology, vascular medicine, and vascular surgery. This trial is funded by the National Institute of Health, Heart, Blood, and Lung Institute. So Dr. Alec Farber is a professor of surgery and radiology at Boston University School of Medicine and the chief of vascular and endovascular surgery at Boston Medical Center. Dr. Matthew Menard is an associate professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School and is a co-director of the endovascular surgery and program director of the vascular surgery fellowship at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Farber and Dr. Menard. Good morning, Adam. Good morning. So we'll just get started. Can you give us a brief history of the trial and kind of where we are today uh, in your words? So it all started in, uh, in October of 2007 when Matt and I were actually at the uh, New England Society for Vascular Surgery meeting at the Foxwoods Casino. Uh, where it was held that year. And we basically had a discussion over, over a few drinks about how little data there is to support care of patients with uh, chronic limb-threatening ischemia. You know, a patient that might come to one of us that might be chosen for open bypass uh, versus endovascular therapy based on things like the availability of the operating room or the hybrid suite or uh, even our personal schedules and how random it was and how little science there was really to support treatment of these patients. And we dreamed of actually answering the question about what to do when a patient comes to your office with CLI and, you know, is there a way to answer this question correctly? Should the the patient, if they have good veins, should they have a bypass or should they have endovascular therapy? Is endo first really the right way to go? We kind of had a dream of trying to answer that question. So uh, just to pick up on that, since then, much has happened in a a fairly laborious and interesting kind of grant application process. Uh, We enlisted the help of of a number of our kind of senior surgical mentors, uh, at one point brought in a number of kind of esteemed endovascular folks to kind of help us shape a trial uh, that we thought uh, would potentially answer this question. We, we reached out in March of 2009 uh, to Bob Zwolak, who at the time was the president of the uh, Society of Vascular Surgery. Uh, and he recommended, we talked to Ron Dolman, who at the time was the, um, the, uh, the head of the research council, and Ron suggested that, that we contact the NIH. Uh, and we did. Uh, we called, called the NIH in April of 2009. We pitched their idea. Uh, and they were very, uh, I was, I, you know, I was very nervous before that call because uh, I didn't know what they would say. Uh, but they were actually very friendly and very nice. And they basically said, gee, you know, if you have an idea, you should uh, come and present it to us. And, and then because you're going to need a lot of money for this, uh, you know, anything that's, that requires more than half a million dollars a year from the NIH requires a very special process. And uh, you basically have to write a letter asking for permission to submit the R1 application, and that letter already has to have a, uh, the, the dollar amount that you're asking. Basil had been done, uh, and it was actually a similar trial, but was at that point well over 10, 10 years old. Uh, Prevent 3 was a big randomized trial uh, just in the open surgical arm, and so this was relatively new territory. We wanted to really start from the ground and, and craft a, a trial that would be really well created and, and not have any of the mistakes of basal or, or the pitfalls or limitations of the other uh, efforts and really successfully answer the question that we were trying to answer. Our original conception was just uh, 
to involve surgeons and take surgeons that did both open and endo and thinking that they would have the highest degree of equipoise, no skin in the game, happy with either result. Our reviewers on the first series of grant applications were heavily weighted towards cardiology and, and the reviews came back, you know, where the heck are the cardiologists, where are the radiologists and so NIH directed this to be a multidisciplinary effort. And ultimately we felt that was absolutely the correct way to go. And so uh, we spent a lot of effort trying to remove all bias, hidden bias or overt bias that might uh, tip the scales in one way or the other. I also want to say that we brought in Kenya Rosenfield who is our third partner and principal investigator. He's an interventional cardiologist who has been wonderful in helping us design and execute this trial. But uh, having said that, vascular surgeons are very active in this trial. And, and the re reason for that is the majority of critical limb ischemia, at least in the United States, is treated by vascular surgeons. So th there is an overwhelming number of vascular surgeons involved. So for instance, out of 930 investigators in the trial today, uh, 74 percent of vascular surgeons, but again, that's because that's who treats uh, CLI more commonly. Ultimately, got funded uh, right in the middle. Uh, perhaps some people remember the days of sequestration, where funding for NIH trials was at an all-time low. Only seven percent of grant applications at the NIH were being funded at that time. So we felt enormously happy that this was recognized as a worthwhile effort. We began enrolling in 2014, and it's been a labor of love, but everyone involved in the trial has, has done tremendous work to move the bar forward, and we're currently about 84% of the way enrolled. So the finish line is, is in sight. So, Dr. Menard, you brought up the Basel trial, and, and I think that the, it may be helpful for people to get a little historical perspective as well. What were some of the weaknesses that you saw in the Basel trial that you tried to address in the design of Best CLI specifically? Yeah, it's a great question. So there's a number of them. And the first one that probably gets the most amount of press is the fact that it was not a pragmatic trial. So a lot of trials dictate what care gets given. So a given carotid stent trial will 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 use the stent platform and embolic protection platform of of the company that might be sponsoring the trial. In the case of Basil, they have a very different healthcare system and are very parsimonious. And at that time, they didn't believe that stenting had data to support it. So the endovascular arm was primarily limited to balloon antiplasty alone. Uh, a few folks later in the trial had some bailout stenting, but for the most part, it was angioplasty alone. And by the time the trial was published, most people outside of Britain, in Europe, and in the United States did not feel that that represented kind of standard of care or the, or the way they practiced. So it is one of the biggest limitations of a non-pragmatic trial. So we thought long and hard about that and ultimately designed best uh, to be pragmatic. And what that means is we leave the individual treatment strategy to whoever randomizes uh, the patient. Uh, another one is the endpoint of amputation-free survival. So it is the gold standard, has been the gold standard forever. But if you take a few minutes and think through the implications of that endpoint, it really falls short. So if you do an endovascular intervention and for whatever reason the patient never gets an amputation or never dies, the endpoint does not reflect the differences between one endpoint or another. So we devised a number of endpoints, many modeled on the OPG or the outbound performance goals set by the SVS. And our primary endpoint is male free survival. We're still looking at amputation free survival and we'll be well powered for that. We have an endpoint of major reintervention and minor reintervention free survival as well. And then a number of endpoints that get to the impact of each intervention, as well as some hemodynamic and more clinical uh, weighted endpoints. So the endpoint was another big option. And then uh, the third is sort of the definition of critical limb ischemia. They used this concept called severe limb ischemia, which had a different implication in terms of breast pain and who met the criteria. That's a little bit more of an esoteric difference, but another kind of important point. And Dr. Farber, any uh, thoughts from you on the uh, basal trial or the previous literature in this area? 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's interesting. There have been more than 100,000 patients studied in the coronary artery disease space in randomized controlled trials. And in that particular space, a lot of questions have been answered in CAD and how uh, patients with CAD are managed. And in contrast, in the field of critical ischemia, there's only been one trial. 452 patients in basal constitutes the only group of patients that speak to the management of CLI in the space. So a dramatic difference, and of course, in turn, a dramatic difference in evidence base on which physicians base their treatments. And so, as Matt said, Basil was a valiant effort on the part of Professor Bradbury, and we give him a lot of credit, and uh, we work very closely with him even today. But it was limited. It was underpowered. The lesions were not standardized. I think that uh, Matt talked about amputation-free survival, which is an endpoint that, although has been used widely, uh, focuses too much on death and uh, is not a great endpoint when you're comparing revascularization strategy. And, of course, the issue of uh, pragmatic trial and lack thereof for Basel I all made Basel, although a valiant effort, not a conclusive one. And we have taken all of this into account in the design of BEST. Uh, we had several summits of our executive committee that consists of really the leaders in the field of PAD and CLI across disciplines of vascular medicine and vascular surgery and radiology and interventional cardiology. And together, we weighed all the pros and cons of trial design and compromised on a trial that really was as good as it can be. And so in that end, we feel very strongly that BEST has been designed in a way that where every little nook and cranny of design has been very carefully thought out and optimized, I would say. Uh, I, I would dare anybody to actually design a trial that's better designed. And, and the reason I say that, not to be arrogant, because so much time and effort has been spent by so many people in concert with one another that I, I truly believe that, that it's, it's really been designed in an optimal kind of way. And it's very important because part of the reason why there's been so few trials in the space is that the space is very difficult to study because of the heterogeneity of the patients and the morbidities of the patients and the heterogeneity of lesions and so on and so forth. Uh, maybe this leads to our next question, you know, especially because, like you said, th this is a very diverse patient population. Can you guys walk us through the process of evaluating a patient for enrollment in the trial, how you identify a good patient for this, and what are the most commonly encountered criteria that exclude a patient from participation in best CLI? We believe that all patients with CLI uh, should be considered for the trial because uh, if you do not do that, it is very difficult to enroll. Now, in looking at the universe of patients with CLI, obviously, we're only looking to include those patients who are candidates for both open and endovascular surgery. So patients who are in a nursing home who are non-ambulatory are not included. For patients who are facing an amputation, major amputation, are not included. Uh, patients who have uh, a very high risk of complications with open surgery, be it things like uh, recent myocardial infarction or a uh, three-vessel coronary artery disease that's irreconstructible or critical aortic stenosis that's irreconstructible. Those patients who are truly not candidates for open surgery are excluded. Of course, most CLI patients are at least at moderate risk for surgery, and they are included. So everybody needs to be really considered. We also exclude patients who are demented, who cannot consent for themselves, who are prisoners, and so forth. That's sort of the larger universe of patients that we, we focus on. Speaking more to the actual process, so the process sort of is one that hopes to capture all the patients we see in an outpatient fashion in the clinic, as well as all the inpatients or folks that come in to the emergency room. So a well-functioning site uh, has an ability to kind of tag all the, all the potential CLI patients on the service and as Alex said, kind of consider them for randomization. Are there any common resources or strategies that some sites have to make them more successful at recruiting patients? Absolutely. The sites that are the most successful have several uh, similarities. So number one, that they have a champion, somebody at the site who really wants this to succeed. You know, the reality is everybody's busy with clinical work. 
there are competing trials, uh, competing interests. And it's always useful to have one person who has a fire in the belly for, for, for best and understand the importance of it. The second, I think, important fact is the sites that have been very successful are ones that have a venue for investigators to meet together regularly to talk about PAD patients and potential patients for best. So, for instance, University of Southern California, which happens to be the number one enroller, you know, they have a weekly PAD conference where patients are discussed in a multidisciplinary setting and decisions are made and questions are asked about whether or not patients are a best candidate. So I think those two factors are incredibly important. And of course, the site has to have a research coordinator that's dedicated to the trial. There are some sites where uh, research coordinator's time is parsed out in a way that's not optimal uh, for the trial. And lastly, successful sites are sites that see a lot of patients with PAD and CLI and do both open vascular surgery and endovascular therapy. Are you seeing that some of the successful sites have enrollers from different specialties, or is it usually one specialty at that site? Like USC, for example, is it only surgeons, or is it surgeons and cardiologists and radiologists who are enrolling at that site? No. So 72% of our sites are multidisciplinary, and some of the best sites actually have multiple specialties enrolling. So USC is a perfect example. They have vascular surgeons enrolling, but they also have cardiologists enrolling. So just to flesh out some of the specific reasons why a patient or a site might enroll or not enroll. So there's no question. So over the course of time, we've kind of identified a number of common themes and common what we call barriers to enrollment. And there's no question that the top barrier is bias, so the investigator bias. Mm -hmm. You can well imagine, based on our training and, and everything that kind of leads up to participation in the trial, we actually try to form opinions on on what we think. That's kind of how we're trained to practice medicine. And we bring those to the trial. And it's sometimes very difficult for folks, you know, a senior surgeon who's been doing successful bypass for decades and is a little bit skeptical of endovascular, you know, to get him or her to say, okay, you know, in a given patient, maybe it has some value. On the other hand, an extremely talented interventional cardiologist or vascular surgeon with endo skills who hasn't done bypass in a while, and if that patient comes to pass, would have to hand off that patient to one of their vascular surgery colleagues, you know, and they believe in their heart of hearts that they can get through pretty much anything and successfully treat a patient. It's hard for folks like that to kind of take a step back and say, you know what, the data that we have today is lacking, and here's an opportunity to kind of test my bias and sort of prove that my way of thinking is actually correct. So a lot of effort to kind of get folks to to recognize that bias and then overcome it in the context of the trial. But if they can, that's a real boon to a given site in their success. The other ones are sort of more logical and predictable, folks that for whatever reason are not candidates for open surgery, you know, they might be a task A lesion, or they're so loaded with multi-level disease that people feel they're not candidates for an endo approach. We do have some exclusion criteria, such as if someone had a prior SFA or popliteal stent, and that's occluded, that's a reason to, to screen out of the trial. You have to wait a certain amount of time if someone's had a prior endovascular or, or surgical approach. So uh, a number of additional barriers. Do you think that's just because having a, a occluded stent makes the likelihood of failure of endovascular significantly higher? Because if you say you had a prior tibial intervention, would that exclude you or no? In our discussions with our leadership that designed the trial, there are a lot of folks who felt that including patients who have occluded or restenosed SFA or popliteal stents would unfairly bias the trial against endo. And this is just an example of the conversation that we had in the design of the trial. And the reality is, revascularizing an occluded stent is a different beast than revascularizing a native artery. Some people would agree with that. And so that's why we chose uh, to exclude this particular uh, scenario. With respect to tibials, although tibial stents are not that common, they, they still are, are of course, are, have been used. So we're allowing tibial stents as long as if the stent is open, not, not a problem. If the stent is restenosed or occluded, as long as you're revascularizing another tibial, 
then the stent is allowed. And is prior surgery, like prior bypass, considered a, a contraindication or no? Because, I mean, obviously redo bypass surgery is also more complex than primary disease, you know? I knew you were going to ask that, and it's a great question. And a lot of debate about that very point. Ultimately, we do allow it, thinking it's a little bit of a different beast. And, you know, the argument that it should have been excluded is that you're identifying a subgroup of patients that are so-called bad actors and in the same way as an occluded endo intervention might tip you into that category, you know, why wouldn't surgical bypass failure tip you into that category? So certainly you can make a strong argument that they should have been excluded. I think most of us felt that you can re-intervene in a little bit of a different way and the implications of a re-intervention are are a little different. So ultimately, we did allow it. I want to say a couple of comments about trial design. This whole issue of inclusion and exclusion criteria. In the ideal world, when you add inclusion and exclusion criteria, you make a population that you're studying more homogeneous. And that's great. And in fact, we that's what we initially chose to do. CLI patients are so heterogeneous. The problem, though, is as you increase the inclusion and exclusion criteria to make a population more homogeneous and easier to study, that population becomes harder to enroll. Uh, There has to be a very delicate balance reached between having appropriate inclusion and exclusion criteria, but yet not too many of them, because otherwise you can't enroll into the trial. It's a very delicate balance. And and we've walked that balance. Initially, you know, we we sort of wondered how, if you look at basal, there's so few inclusion and exclusion criteria. And we wondered that, you know, who's actually in the trial? And as a result, we placed a lot of criteria in place in our first version of the protocol and found very early that it was very difficult to enroll, not impossible. And so we ended up scaling back and only leaving the criteria that are truly, truly relevant uh, to the question of being asked. And, and if it's too restrictive, also, it may not reflect the patients you're seeing ultimately, you know? To get a little bit more into the details and the specifics of the trial, the outcome of the trial is major adverse limb events, free survival defined as above ankle amputation of the index limb or major re-intervention. Could you discuss kind of how this was chosen and then how you decided how long you would follow these patients out after the trial and conclusion? We knew that amputation-free survival was not a good endpoint to compare intervention strategies. We knew that. And we knew that we wanted something better. And it turns out that the OPG committee of the Society for Vascular Surgery uh, has met literally... uh, a year before we were, we were having these thoughts and, and, and actually develop these endpoints to follow uh, new investigational uh, devices. And one of their endpoints was male-free survival. And we thought this was a great endpoint to use because it really brought in uh, interventions to the death and amputation piece, uh, which we thought were important. Now, the question then became, uh, which interventions do we uh, include? Do we include all interventions or do we include only the major ones? And that was a big uh, conversation that we had with our executive committee. And the problem is, is that if you include, on one hand, you, wanna, you might want to say, let's just include all, all interventions. But then, again, you're biasing against the whole point of endovascular therapy, where you can <clears throat> bring the patient back for a few touch-ups and really not really affect their condition much. Uh, and so in the end, we decided that we only wanted to include major interventions and leave smaller interventions like angioplasty or placing of a stent or even vein patch angioplasty, surgical angioplasty, away from this uh, endpoint. We do have another endpoint called reintervention and amputation-free survival, which is a key secondary endpoint that includes amputation of all reinterventions. And so, in a way, we thought male was best compromised to really include things that are major, but exclude things that might be considered as, as a minor touch-up. We spent a lot of time trying to design, as we mentioned earlier, kind of the optimal primary endpoint. It's critically important because it's the one endpoint that people look at. I don't always look at secondary endpoints, and the statistical power of the secondary endpoints is never as, as robust as the primary endpoint. So that, to us, seemed like the best way to capture the impact of each treatment strategy. So if we're you know, attempting to really understand the first step in the sequence that is CLI care and to really understand the, the implications over the course of the lifetime of the patient, that seemed to us 
to be the best endpoint. Uh, does take into effect amputation, does take into effect survival, uh, but it also takes into effect the kinds of clinical decisions that we make in wrestling with whether to intervene or not. And some of the limitations of many trials in the cardiovascular space are the subjective nature. And, and I'm mostly referring to target vessel revascularization, target lesion revascularization, which are very prominent endpoints in uh, industry sponsored trials looking at new technology. And if you think through them, someone does an intervention, there's various degrees of rigor in following the impact of that intervention, be it an ultrasound, possibly a CT or an MR, possibly an angiogram, but mostly it's a duplex, or it's just the clinical uh, status of the patient, and the investigator then has to decide whether they're going to re-intervene or not. So it's a, it's a flawed endpoint. Um, and uh, it just gets to the importance of, en of endpoints and, and the impact they have in terms of new technology being uh, adopted or accepted or thought to be uh, appropriate and, and gets to the, obviously, the impact of our, our interventions that we're testing. So I did mention a number of secondary endpoints that we have, and then there's a few others as well that I think Bear mentioned, never really has there been endpoints that have looked at the hemodynamic consequence of a, of a treatment strategy. Uh, and, and we felt that that was very important. So we have specific endpoints that are going to look at the hemodynamic consequence of things like ABI, things like continued perfusion, uh, things like change in Rutherford status over time. And also, endpoints that look at the overall burden of CLI. We know that it's a lot like cancer. It is a kind of a lifelong problem hallmarked by frequent recurrences. And so we have endpoints such as freedom from critical limb ischemia or critical limb ischemia free survival. The goal of those endpoints is to have a tumor free survival or a cancer free survival analog. And those are very useful endpoints in the oncology world, and we sort of think of it the same way uh, with critical limb ischemia. So we're excited about those additional endpoints as well uh, to kind of round out the entire picture of the impact of, of that first step in treatment. And so how long are you looking to follow these patients for this trial? Yeah, so that's a great question. And in the end, because the trial is not done yet and we're still negotiating a completion date with an NHLBI, uh, we can only estimate. So at this point, we estimate that the mean follow-up is going to be 3.9 years uh, and that the range is going to be between 1 and 6.8 years. Now, this is just an estimate and will probably change uh, once the uh, trial is actually, actually completed. Another component of the trial is to evaluate for cost-effectiveness. How do you look to quantify this and then does that differ depending on the sites that are Canadian or, or European? Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, obviously, cost effectiveness is incredibly important because in the end, what we're really asking is, what is the value of endovascular versus open surgical intervention in these patients as first intervention? What is the value? And for that, we need cost. Uh, and so we, are, we have a cost effectiveness core at the Brigham Women's Hospital. It's led by Dr. Natish Chowdhury, who is an expert in this field. And the plans are to look at all the financial costs of care, uh, hospital care, outpatient care, rehab care. The plan is also to look at functional status and quality of life metrics. And we have a number of endpoints that we are going to be uh, using uh, to that end. So treatment-associated costs, incremental cost effectiveness measured in dollars for quality-adjusted life years or qualities, uh, and so forth. Now, obviously, cost is different in the uh, United States, and Canada, and Europe, in New Zealand, uh, which is where our flights are. And so uh, the cost part of this is really going to be limited to the United States. And then something else that's a hot topic right now is the paclitaxel-coated devices. Do you think this controversy will affect the outcome of this study at all? This whole um, paclitaxel storm occurred I guess it started about uh, six to eight months ago, and it's been brewing, and, and all thing, things have been happening. And, and 
you know, we are not testing paclitaxel per se, but our patients uh, in the trial have been have been treated with paclitaxel devices. So we had to, uh, we really had to respond to what's been happening. And so initially, we sent a letter to all the best investigators in December of 2018, explaining to them about, about what was happening and telling them that. Uh, at that particular point, uh, the choice of use of Beclitaxel was up to them. And then once the FDA sent their final letter, uh, we sent it uh, to everybody. And I think this occurred in, in March of 2019. And on April 30th, we sent another letter uh, to Best CLI leadership. And, and basically what we said was that uh, the investigators were allowed to use Beclitaxel in the trial at their own discretion, which again reinforced the FDA directive that we encouraged physicians uh, using Peclitaxel to have full discussion of risks and benefits with patients. Uh, and uh, we asked for every principal investigator at each site to personally acknowledge the receipt of both of our memo and we included the FDA letter as well to inform all co-investigators. So basically everybody knew what, what was happening. And this is similar to sort of what the FDA wanted. Then, then the FDA panel happened. Uh, and we presented at the panel, this was last month, and we basically told the FDA that in the end, uh, we are going to have, in best, a cohort of patients with CLI who were treated with paclitaxel, and that that might be very useful in the end, at some point in the future, to analyze outcomes of paclitaxel in CLI, which is, you know, there's not a lot of outcomes of paclitaxel in CLI. All those randomized trials uh, in the Catano's uh, manuscript, most of them were, were unclotable. So we had something to offer the FDA. So our posture right now is uh, we're encouraging people to, certainly they have to, if, they, if they're going to use Beclitaxel with them best, they have to have a conversation with the patient about that. We know that a lot of sites have stopped using Beclitaxel, but it's an issue because the Institutional Review Board are, are asking questions at various sites about what to do and, and whether or not a separate consent is needed. And, and our response is uh, we're not going to create a separate consent. And that the discussion about Beclitaxel at each institution really needs to not just focus on the use in BEST, but really the, the use in the whole institution. As such, at some sites, Beclitaxel use has been suspended. So in the end, I think it will be, uh, it's certainly a confounder for the study, uh, but it's just part of life. Things like this happen uh, when we run trials over a long period of time. Dr. Farber, when can we expect to learn some of the results from the trial? Is there any, any preliminary data that you're able to share with us at this point, or is it still too early? There are a lot of things that we've learned already. We have learned that the investigators who are participating in BEST in the United States uh, have the same specialty profile ratio uh, within the trial as they do in, me in the Medicare database. And this is a paper that Rick Powell authored and it was published in the Journal of Vascular Surgery several months ago, uh, which basically means that the people who are treating patients uh, in CLI in the United States within BEST are, are similar with respect to their specialties to who, who's treating uh, CLI uh, uh, in, in the Medicare database. So we've learned that. We also know that patient characteristics of the cohort is that the majority of patients in BEST uh, have both tissue loss and tibial disease, and the minority have less pain and no tibial disease. And these are, you know, the clinical presentation and uh, anatomy are two factors that we're stratifying on. We also know that about a third of the patients in BEST are women, 30% of patients in BEST are of non-white race, and 15% or so are Hispanics. And then lastly, we know that the demographic characteristics of patients with invest are very similar to those that you would expect to see in a population of patients with CLI, which is very encouraging. And then finally, the rate of crossover, which is basically patients are randomized to, uh, let's say, endo, not getting endo but getting open, is something that we want to avoid, is only 4%, which suggests that the trial is being executed, executed well. Is the rate of crossover, is it similar in both arms or is it more in one arm than the other? It's a little higher in the uh, open to end arm. I guess that makes sense. But this it's actually less than we predicted. And these are estimate numbers. Obviously, they change. And, and the reason I know these numbers is because uh, twice a year, we prepare an open report for the our data safety monitoring board. And for that report, the open part of it, we can see. And so we know these numbers. These numbers have not been published because they're ever so changing. Uh, but... What we don't know, obviously, is, is we don't have access to the outcomes. 
And no, that's going to have to wait until the trial finish. With doing a trial like this, you said you had some input from the, the NIH, but was there any other mentorship that you received for uh, putting together the trial design and, uh, and kind of de- developing a, a trial as complicated as this? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we um, did not have a lot of experience, uh, neither in uh, trial design nor in organizing trials of, 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 of any kind, to be honest with you. Uh, we certainly have done research. Both of us have done research in the past. Uh, we had a strong interest in, in PAD. We had a strong clinical interest in both in open and endo as sort of modern vascular surgeons, but, but we had very little experience in child design. We knew the question needed to be asked, but you know, obviously there's much more that goes into this. And so we uh, surrounded ourselves with experts who actually helped us do what we needed to do. We, we uh, sought help from some of our mentors. So uh, Rick Powell at Dartmouth, Hitchcock, is a mentor of mine. I've trained with him. Mike Conti, who at the time was at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, was a mentor to Matt. And both Rick and Mike were incredibly helpful in helping us sort of draft uh, the outline of what needed to be done. Mike Krieger, who was at the Brigham and now is at Dartmouth, uh, was also a part of this small group that initially met regularly and really helped us figure out the initial direction of, our, of the path. We also uh, had multiple conversations with our data coordinating center, the New England Research Institute, uh, who had at the time experts who were really interested in uh, trial design and they had experience with trial design and they really wanted to work on this trial with us. So bringing these people together really helped us with getting the trial designed. And I think it's just a message for anybody out there who has a dream they want to execute on that don't get flustered, don't get disillusioned if you don't think you have enough experience uh, to get it done because you can. If you have uh, fire in your belly, and you, you have an important question needs to be answered. There are people out there that can help you answer that. So this is sort of a message for all the young investigators out there: don't get uh, disillusioned. Uh, move forward on all cylinders uh, on your dreams, and I think there's a good chance you'll get them accomplished. We've actually had a lot of guidance slash mentorship, I guess you'd call it, from our colleagues at the NIH. Uh, They've been really fantastic to work with. They're hugely supportive, always kind of willing to help and always kind of able to connect us to the right people. Our DSMB is is our data safety monitoring board is kind of filled with experienced trialists. And they have also been very helpful in kind of helping us guide through some challenges. And finally, I guess I would just mention our, our executive committee in addition to to Mike Conti, uh, it's chaired by Chris White, an interventional cardiologist at uh, Oshner, and also a very experienced trialist and kind of wise um, clinician uh, who's brought a lot of excellent advice and support along the way. We've got some powerhouse folks as well. Mike Dake is a name probably known to most folks, an interventional radiologist most recently at Stanford and now at Arizona. Michael Jaff and John Kaufman, in addition to Mark Krieger. So all of these folks have been very supportive and served to guide uh, both Alec and Kenny and I as we wrestle with challenges along the way. Thank you so much for going through this trial. It's it's a definitely a complex trial design. It sounds like you've addressed some major issues in the literature to really make sure that this is a success. Anything that you want to close with or make sure that our listeners know about the trial or vascular surgery in general? This trial is a, is a testament to a couple of things. Number one, that dreams can come true. That if you have a, an idea that's great, uh, that even though you may not have the experience or the background, that if you, that if you believe in it enough and, and, you, and you get the right team together, that you, you can accomplish it. And, and I think that's an important message to all the young investigators out there. The second part is that uh, vascular surgery is a very small field, and it's nice to be able to execute on a trial where vascular surgery has a leadership role. And it's been an important tool for us to garner support for the trial, to kind of remind people, at least the vascular surgeons, that, you know, this is an important trial for vascular surgery and that they need to participate to support it. And then the third thing I'll say is I think VEST is an avenue for multidisciplinary collaboration. I think in the end, 
despite all of our differences, uh, it is important to find a way for all the specialties uh, to collaborate together and work together. And I think BEST is an opportunity for that to happen, both on a large scale, national, really international scale, but also at all the individual sites. I think it's wonderful to see how well, for example, interventional cardiology and vascular surgery are collaborating at USC. I think it's wonderful to see that. And, and I think that uh, BEST only supports and encourages that sort of collaboration. And to that end, I think it's a very good thing for us to do. I just reiterate the call that if, if anyone has any aspirations, don't be shy, act on them. You never know where it's going to lead you. I would also give a huge thanks to all the folks that have participated in the trial, almost a thousand investigators doing a lot of hard work, all three fields, cardiology, radiology, surgery, uh, most vascular surgery, but everyone's contributed. And I think another kind of exciting kind of ancillary benefit is we now, I think for the first time in this country, have a real vascular community of dedicated trialists. I mean, in many sites, you know, 150 sites, mainly in, in America and in Canada, that have proven their ability to rise to the challenge of a, a very difficult trial to enroll into a difficult group of patients. Uh, and again, can't say it enough. This is one question that we're trying to answer. There's a huge number of additional questions and further questions. My point in sort of talking about uh, our cardiology colleagues is, is they've really set an extremely high bar for answering clinical questions. So they've systematically uh, identified clinical questions that need answering, and they do trials. They get, they get them done efficiently and kind of cost effectively, and and that guides treatment. And so their treatment is not uh, so much bias. It's not so much personal opinion, uh, but it's really based on high quality level one data. And that's our goal in vascular surgery and, and vascular medicine to do the same thing. So we've got our work cut out for us, but it's exciting to think we have a whole cadre of, of investigators and trial sites that could potentially be, you know, levied to do the next generation of investigations. We are Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. We'd like to make our listeners aware that there are still a few spots left to register for the Big Apple Boot Camp in New York City, New York, on September 19th to the 21st. This is a two-day skills course intended for first-year vascular fellows or third or fourth-year integrated residents. For more information on how to register and who to contact for more information, click the link in our show notes.